This is Laura Cincinnati, the creator of MicroBe and RubyMotion, and you're listening to the ChangeLog podcast. Welcome to the ChangeLog episode 0.8.4. I'm Adam Stakoviak. And I'm Wynn Netherland. This is the ChangeLog. We cover what's fresh and new and open source. If you found us on iTunes, we're also up on the web at thechangelog.com. We're also up on GitHub. Head to github.com slash explore. You'll find some trending repos, some feature repos from our blog, as well as the audio podcast. And if you're on Twitter, you can follow the changelog and me, Adam Stack. And I'm Penguin, P-E-N-G-W-Y-N-N. Fun episode this week, a little, something a little different. Um, Andrew and I talked about the news of the pretty much the last month. We used to do the archive shows. We're trying to get back into that groove. Bringing uh, it back, huh? Bringing it back. So Andrew, if you haven't met him, is uh, he's been keeping the fires burning on the blog with a lot of good HTML5 content. Andrew hails from Virginia. Andrew P. Thorpe on Twitter. Yeah, I like Andrew. Good guy. Andrew's a good guy. We met recently when he uh, came to Dallas. Hopefully he can uh, relocate down here. Have another uh, good Rubyist in the DFW area. There you go. So we kind of ran through the uh, the news of the month. We're hoping to kind of reinstate this. Maybe once a month, just to uh, talk about what's popular on the blog. There you go. It's, it's always good to do a roundup of what's been out there to just get uh, the thoughts. You know? We do so many quick hits, it's, it's nice to come back and see what resonates with the listeners. Yeah, piece it all together. Fun episode this week. Should we get to it after this quick word from RubyConf Argentina? Let's do it. We're chatting today with Ernesto Tagworker. He's going to tell us about RubyConf Argentina. Hey, Wen. Yeah, uh, RubyConf Argentina is a yearly event organized by the Ruby Argentina Association. And uh, last year we had some really renowned speakers from all over the world, uh, like Aaron Patterson, Scott Chacon, Constantine Hasse, and Matt Imanetti. And this year is going to be October 19th and 20th? Yeah, that's right. Where's the location? It's going to be uh, October 90th, 90th and 20th in uh, Paseo La Plaza which is a big theater in the heart of Buenos Aires, uh, close to a lot of things, a lot of touristic sites. And, uh, yeah, we're, we're happy to have uh, an, an, a place that is bigger than last year. So in addition to those speakers, who's going to be speaking this year? Uh, this year we're going to have speakers from all over the world, again, uh, like uh, Nicolas Sanguinetti from Uruguay, uh, also known as God Foca. Um, Pedro Bello from Heroku, uh, you, Wynn from GitHub, and Alejandro Gonzalez from Chile. Um, also, we have not closed our, our uh, you know, proposal call, so if you're interested in sending your proposal, we'll be happy to review it, and hopefully you can make it uh, as a speaker this year. You've got till August 17th to get that in, right? Yes, that is correct. We're still awaiting details on tickets and some other things, but where can folks go to learn more about the conference? Uh, if you want to know more about the conference or see the videos from last year's talk, you can go to rubyconfargentina.org, and you'll find all the talks, all the information about the place where it'll be, all the sponsors we have, and uh, what, what we're planning for this year. Well, I'm definitely looking forward to it. It'll be my first trip down to Argentina and hope to see uh, the rest of you, the listeners down there, and Ernesto, it'll be the first time that we've met face-to-face, so I'm looking forward to that, too. Cool. Yeah, we're, we're really looking forward to having you over and uh, having uh, new speakers uh, as, as well as uh, speakers that we had last year. And I would just uh, like to point out that we have talks for all levels. We have talks for advanced uh, Rubyists and for beginners, too. We have the Ruby Fun Day, which will have workshops for those who are interested in getting into Ruby. And we will have uh, really advanced talks by this uh, awesome speakers that we're, we're still uh, confirming as, as we speak. So one more time, that's October 19th and 20th in Buenos Aires, RubyConf Argentina. See you there. Welcome to the Changelog Archive. It's been a while since we've done one of these rap shows, but we thought it was due. I wanted to say a special welcome to Andrew Thorpe, who joins us online. Yeah, thanks for having me. So First Andrew's, time caller. 
<laughs> First time caller, long time listener. Andrew's been helping out with uh, contributing to Change Log, I guess, since May. And uh, we'll, uh, we're certainly glad to have him on board. And this time is the first time on the audio. So what we do here, if you're new to this format, we're just going to run down uh, not news of the day, but news of the last f- couple of months. Usually we used to do this about once a month. It's been a while since we've been in that regular rhythm, but we thought we've had enough uh, kind of stack up on the site that we can talk through some of these and just uh, share what you might have missed on the change log. So up first, get Spective, Facebook style timeline for your GitHub feed. You seen this one? Yeah, I uh, I think this was actually one of the um, one of the first ones that I actually tried to mess around with when I when I saw it pop up here, and and it seemed like it was uh, pretty neat at the time um, when I saw it. The features seemed like they were still kind of being worked through, but it it definitely looked like it had some good potential. I enjoyed it. It's from our buddy Zach. This is it brings kind of Facebook style timeline. If you're familiar with the new Facebook cover style timeline for your Facebook feed. This brings it to your GitHub feed and puts it kind of uh, the vertical line for the, for the timeline and then they're stacked, events are stacked on each side of those. It's a nice way to visualize your GitHub feed. It uses the GitHub API, which I'm a fan. Yeah, you would be. I. Uh, it's interesting actually because as much as I love GitHub, I think everybody loves GitHub, but one of the things that has been difficult for me is figuring out the activity, the feed, the notifications from GitHub, and I wonder if uh, projects like this will kind of help to take that to the next level. It would be interesting, but I've frequently found myself seeing, you know, I have 20-something notifications from GitHub that I never even re- kind of realized that were there, so it would be cool to see uh, some of this stuff get incorporated into some of the GitHub uh, core. It's a hard problem from a UX perspective just to handle that much data, especially unlike a lot of social networks, these are really different types of activity that we've got on the GitHub activity timeline. So this does a good job of kind of presenting that in a a filterable format. Yeah, I think we're so used to, with the social world, we're so used to following everything you can find and friending everybody you can find, but I found myself wanting to kind of purge out some of these projects that I had been following um, with that mindset just to kind of clean it up a little bit. And I found once I did that, it made the activity feed a little bit easier. So um, I actually did that because when I was looking through this Gitspective, I noticed that there was just a bunch of stuff in there that I didn't really care about anymore. So I was very interested with it, uh, very interested in its potential. It it just definitely caught my attention. You know, I find myself doing that too, uh, kind of reserving what I watch on GitHub just because it adds so much noise to the timeline. It reminds me of the Seinfeld episode where um, they were discontinuing the the sponge and uh, Elaine was going around uh, wondering if her boyfriends were sponge worthy. Now I have to wonder if a project is watch worthy for me to be able to pull the trigger to pollute my timeline with all of its commits. So it's like Twitter bootstrap. I mean, how many people are following that now? Yeah, specifically Twitter Bootstrap. Actually, there are a few projects that we that we uh, have have written about on the change log that I've noticed are just there are so many followers, and I'm wondering. I mean, I wonder when I see that does that does that mean that this project is something that everyone should keep note of, or is it just the um, the world that we're living in with you know? following everything you can possibly find and those have just been around longer i don't know it's, it's interesting it's kind of the social world that we're living in now well bootstrap and specifically i guess has got twice as many followers as the number two project on github um and it just creates a massive amount of data problems just in of itself but uh yeah it's popularity breeds uh new problems but i guess those are good problems to have yeah, it's, the old, it's an old problem. You want to become popular, but there's a lot of growing pains that come with it. Up next, I want to talk about Hammer.js. This is one of the projects you posted. Yeah, this is actually um, the first one that I posted on the changelog, and uh, I used it quite a few times before I posted this, and I fell in love with it. Um, I was trying to solve the problem of um, handling touch events and handling... Um, click events on one application. So, you know, there's a 
iOS problem where not it's not a problem it's just a design decision where when you put your finger on the screen there's about a 300 millisecond delay before a click event is registered um, and so trying to figure out how to eliminate that when you're trying to do very fast uh, interfaces and instead of manually handling all the touch start and touch stop and you still have to handle click for uh, you know your desktop version of your site it basically gave me a very easy way to just register a tap event or a uh, double tap event or handling some drag problems and so like that is actually a very very useful project and not to mention one of the coolest uh, landing pages I mean hammer js and the the whole their catchphrase is you can touch this it was a very uh, fun project to kind of work with I really really enjoyed that project Extra points on the change log for humor in your readme. This ties into the whole MC Hammer thing they got going. Can't believe you couldn't use Hammer Don't Hurt Him in the headline. That would have been perfect. <laughs> well, you have to realize it was the first thing I was writing, so I wasn't sure exactly how uh, how much creative freedom I had. That may be before your time, anyway. <laughs> and I think it was it was I'm I'm fairly young, but it was uh it was still relatively popular when I was growing up. Sad to admit that I actually caught Hammer in concert. It's one of the first concerts I ever went to. Did you wear your parachute pants to it? I didn't have the sh- the, the pants, but uh, yeah, there was uh, it was an interesting concert, to say the least. Another one that you posted, TweetStream, easily access the Twitter streaming API. So Twitter has a couple of APIs, the REST API, which you, I guess, most people are familiar with, but the sh- streaming API is where you open them. Persist a connection and you get new data it's just kind of sent down to you as it happens in Twitter. One of the Ruby libraries for that is TweetStream, originally uh, created by Entridia, now taken over by Steve and Eric, friends of the show. You wrote this one up? Yeah, so this was actually early on for me too. And, and one of the interesting things about this, um, specifically about this article, was – this was the first time I actually was corrected multiple times um, by specifically by Eric, which was fine. It was interesting to see, uh, even when you're writing an article up about the open source world, that people really enjoy getting involved and helping out. So I think I uh, misrepresented who the authors behind TweetStream were originally, and um, that was able to be corrected. And so yeah, that was a uh, that was encouraging to me to see, even with writing, when I write something incorrectly, the open source world just helps. And that's one of the very attractive things about the open source world to me. But uh, specifically about these two. Um... Okay, so yes, TweetStream is a very neat gem. allows you to hook into the uh, Twitter streaming API. Um, it's actually built on top of uh, EM Twitter, which is an event machine client for the Twitter streaming API. But uh, basically... It's a very, very easy, inter- very easy interface to use that allows you to um, just kind of pull the data into your Ruby application uh, very easily. T, the command line interface for Twitter, is built on top of the TweetStream gem, and I've, I've used all of them. I've been using T a lot. I love that little project. Yeah, I enjoy it. I, I am like you. I really do enjoy the text mode world, um, but for some reason Twitter is the one that I can't, I can't do. I cannot find myself in text mode on Twitter. I, I need to use the uh, Twitter app or the website unfortunately the app hasn't been updated in in quite a while but yeah it's by no means my primary client but i just love the way that uh, t is written to be all unixy under the hood so you can pipe everything between commands and it's kind of prompted me to get into the shell scripting world a little bit deeper Uh, right now i'm trying to write a um, z shell completion script for t just to kind of round out some skills in that area and it's it's kind of fascinating how those work as soon as I get hooked on a, a new command line client, <laughs> the next thing I have to do, because I'm lazy, is uh, build some completion scripts for it because I hate having to look at the usage banner all the time. Yeah, I think the uh, the Z shell completion scripts specifically are incredible. Um, since switching over to Z shell, I have thoroughly enjoyed that. Uh, early on, when I when I was using, um, I think I was using oh my zsh, there was there was a, a few conflicts with some of the completion that was kind of driving me crazy. And since I went to a more vanilla, you know, nothing against all my ZSH, it was actually what kind of got me into the whole world. But since then, I've gone to a more vanilla setup and uh, really enjoyed the power behind those completion scripts. I think you're the one that got me into most of that too. I do, just, I do enjoy it. 
I'm groping my way along as I go. Um, yeah, I started with um, on my Z shell and I started with uh, Janus for Vim and I've jettisoned both of them recently and kind of rolled my own based on Holman's dot files, which we've featured up on uh, dot files dot github dot com. If you haven't seen that, or follow Octodots on Twitter, where uh, if you're interested in getting into the whole dot file space, we're trying to make it easy and give people a kind of a on ramp to, to that whole world because you know I know coming from a dot net background I was it didn't have a GUI I couldn't do it and now I've seen the the power of Unix and just lament uh, how much I wasted my youth on uh, <laughs> Windows platform. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. It was like four go. That's all I got to say about that. <laughs> my phone was ringing right there, so I'm a new I'm new at this. I'm trying to figure out what to do. <laughs> Not a problem. Up next, Sextant. View your Rails routes without waiting on rake. So that's a nice segue. So in Rails now, if you want to view your routes files, one of the, I guess the only way to do that is to uh, run rake routes, and that's in text mode. It's in the, the terminal. Um, and if you're looking for a particular one, you can pipe that to grep or something like that. Um, friend of the show, Richard Schneeman, down in Austin, works at Heroku, uh, has written Sextant. And it's basically a plug-in for Rails, just a gem that you install, that allows you to see your routes directly in the browser. Yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. Um, I think that, you know, using tools like this, I guess it's it's kind of the opposite of text mode. So um, it's, it's taking you to the browser to see what you're doing. W- one of the things that I think is cool about this. I, I tend to, there are a few things like the Git help pages where I tend to want to see them in a browser just because of the uh, the layout and the formatting structure. And I think this is one of them. Um, depending on how wide your your terminal window is, sometimes these, if one line of these routes gets messed up, um, it can really, really confuse you when you're trying to figure out what any of the routes are. So I love this project. I love seeing these routes in the browser, and I always see them formatted correctly, and it's, it just has made it a lot easier for me to figure out you know, what the heck I'm trying to do. That's a good point. If you've got really deeply nested resources, those get uh, kind of wide, and the output in Rake's not that great. Uh, it looks like in the screenshot that uh, he's kind of reproducing that output, putting it directly in the browser, but with uh, on the web, you've got so many more you know, presentation options, hopefully, can solve some of those problems with wrapping because it gets kind of hard to see what lines up with what. Yeah, I believe it's actually a, you know horizontal, horizontally scrolling uh, div that these are wrapped in. So I, I, I just I think, if I'm not mistaken, that I, I had that problem and I brought them up in the browser and I was very, very pleasantly surprised to see that uh, I didn't totally mess up the whole formatting just because of a skinny window. You know, one of the most popular projects of the last few weeks and a couple of months on the changelog has been Ruby Motion. Um, episode uh, 082 was just off the charts in uh, reception, and a lot, you know, all the credit there goes to Laurent and just the project that he's created. But some side projects, uh, I guess community projects, have sprung up around Ruby Motion, and one of those uh, that was quite popular was, um, other than the Ruby Motion toolchain open sourcing uh, that we talked about on the show was the Ruby Motion samples. Have you played around much with Ruby Motion yet? Um, I haven't. I've watched the uh, the Pragmatic Programmers video, um, and I've just kind of been following the community, listening to Sam talk about it, Sam so- Sauce talk about it. Um, it does seem like it's kind of like the solution that everybody's looking for. Uh, it still has some growing to do, I think. But or at it, least Rubyists. <laughs> for Rubyists, yeah. Um, it, I think it still has some growing to do, and if you talk to Laurent, I think he would, would kind of say the same thing. But even just seeing the popularity of this thing explode ever since it released, and you can, if you just go to the website to look at the project, you can see that there's more effort being put into the you know website around the project. seems like they're the customer support options have increased. And so it does seem like it's just exploding and, and rightfully so. I mean, I've heard very good things about it. Some other projects I've been keeping an eye on. I don't think we've posted the change. I'll get form motion was another one that um, allows you to do forms in Ruby motion pretty easily. We'll be sure and put that in the show notes. Um, but there's all of these uh, community source projects that are cropping up to make it even easier to build 
Ruby apps inside of Ruby Motion, or I guess iOS apps inside of Ruby Motion. Yeah, I think that it'll just continue to go that way too. I mean, this is to a Rubyist not having to go into a language like Objective C to do this. I think will just continue to grow, and so I think we'll continue to see um, the community grow around it. I, I believe isn't there a uh, similar to the Ruby Gems um, environment? Isn't there something similar to that for the Ruby Motion or for? There's Cocoa Pods, so you can kind of mix and match between Ruby Gems and then Cocoa Pods allows you to pull in iOS frameworks. And we talked right. to Alloy about that. Alloy on Twitter, his name's Alloy, but uh, it's A L L O Y on the Twitter. There's all, yeah, and there's also the uh, the bubble wrap one that's we've covered on the on the change log, which it seems to be you know they're trying to uh, directly basically map every cocoa wrapper to a Ruby you know Ruby uh, syntax. So yeah, some syntactical sugar for a lot of the the cocoa frameworks. Um, it's another community project. It's a, distributed as a Ruby gem. So you just in gym install bubble wrap, and then you got uh, things like uh, some UI helpers and camera helpers and location helpers built right in. Pretty cool stuff. And there are specific uh, – you can use Ruby gems with Ruby Motion, right? But there are just some specific do's and don'ts when you're doing that. Yeah, I believe that's right. I'm not sure what they are off the top of my head, but I think that I heard Laurent say that actually in the episode, so – Staying with the iOS theme, Cupertino is another one from Matt Thompson. Matt with three T's on the Twitter. It's basically a command line, back to text mode, command line interface for um, the Apple Dev Center. So I know a lot of times when I've had to do tasks in the Apple Dev Center for getting uh, certs and keys and all of that sort of thing, it's just been, it's just a GUI based nightmare for me trying to navigate my way through um, that whole portal. This takes it down to the command line so you can automate a lot of those things, kind of a Thor or a rake style interface. Yeah. I don't know. I didn't know if that was just me or not, but uh, it seems like trying to figure out how to build a uh, Xcode project on my iPad was one of the most difficult things I ever did. Um, oh, I know. I, I didn't understand. I mean, and then to do it on a second computer was even harder, and that was the way that they're handling their certificates and keys. And it seems like this kind of a project is really going to make that a lot easier, which I would be glad to uh, to use on my next uh, iOS project. But, yeah, that that is an area where, you know, I don't – many people don't have – too much bad to say about Apple, but that's probably one of them where they could really use some, some uh, put some of their bright minds behind it just to make that process easier. I, I, really I don't know if it's difficult that. by design or what, but yeah, when you you build your first iOS app, even if it's a Hello World app and you want to see it actually run on the device and outside of the simulator, uh, you know, it's it's kind of opaque the process to, especially if you're in a team-based environment, to get the right device IDs into the right provisioning profile and all of that. Uh, cocktail mixed up to be able to sign the app and put it on your device. Yeah, and if you're working with a team that's specifically, you know, an external team that you are just kind of helping out with, then it's kind of a big process to get added to that team and then to be removed from that team, you know, if that happens. So, yeah, uh, Cupertino definitely seems like it is going to aim to solve those problems, and for me, doing any of that at the command line means that it will be easier to do, so I will welcome that with open arms. Switching gears over to the HTML5 area for a minute, Grunt. I believe this was one of yours. Yeah, so Grunt, um, I'd used it in the past, but not too heavily. Uh, just basically gives you the ability to um, you know, run command line tasks in your uh, JavaScript environment. Um, very, very useful project. Uh, you can, you know, you can use it to test your code quality. You can use it to concatenate files. You can use it to do a lot of things. Um, but it, it's, you know, like a, I'm not sure what to compare it to, but there is a whole community growing up around this tool and plugins are being written for it for different environments. And, 
Um, but I think the ones that are kind of just the standard ones are the you know JavaScript lint and QUnit, Minify, stuff like that. But uh, it's it's a very neat project, and if you haven't used it in any of your um, J- JavaScript projects that could use some automation, I highly recommend trying it. It's it was very easy to get started with, and wrapping your wrapping your head around it can be difficult at first. But once you get it, you you definitely see um, the benefits of it. So. Yeah, I I enjoyed writing that up, and I think this was actually one of the ones that I uh, I heard from quite a few people. As soon as I posted this article for the Grunt, I heard from quite a few people that are like, "Hey, you know, I wrote this tool for uh, this plugin for Grunt. Consider covering this." And I think that that is the goal. I think we kind of want to compile a list of a bunch of different useful plugins, but it it does seem to have its own little community growing up around it. So definitely something worth checking out. We need a way to post multiple repos in the same. Change log article, maybe something we can whip up soon. Um, instead of being a one for one deal, it'd be nice to you know, have a, a topic and then embed three or four, especially if it's a plug in parent child type of relationship like this. Yeah, absolutely. So, staying with the HTML5 theme, uh, Pro is a content editor for GitHub. You're drawing a blank because you don't remember this project at all, do you? I do, but I'm thinking of Impress. Let me bring it up real quick. <laughs> this is the one. It's basically Jekyll in the Sky. Host your blog on Jekyll, but it gives you a, a nice editor to edit content. Oh, yes, yes, yes. So basically, Pros, very cool project, actually. And you can use it to edit uh, anything. You can. It's more or less a front end for editing any kind of a file. Um, on GitHub, any kind of a you know text file on GitHub, but uh, I think the goal is to kind of help you to basically create a Jekyll site and be able to edit that on their in their environment. Uh, very neat, very beautiful interface. Actually, it's you kind of when you start to see some of these projects, you see that a lot of interfaces kind of go in the same direction, and a lot of stuff starts to look very similar because it's what's popular. And when I first saw Pros, I remember thinking that it just seemed fresh. Very beautiful interface, very well done. It took me just a few minutes to get um, to get involved, and they actually imported my my projects in from GitHub, and I was able to kind of browse the files and edit the different pieces of files. I think I, the only thing I really tried was editing a README. But, I mean, you've used Jekyll. You've used Jekyll. I've never used it. You've used it, I think, for your winnetherland.com, if I'm not mistaken. So... You... I tried it back in the day, and there's Octopress on top of that. Uh, I'm a Nesta CMS fan right now. I've been using that uh, lately. But, yeah, I, I love static website generators in, in general, and this kind of gives you the best of both worlds. The downside of doing the static thing with getting GitHub, while well, it's geek-friendly, if you've got non-geeks that want to contribute, it's kind of hard to uh, sometimes to give them the overhead of the Git workflow. This would allow you to have... Uh, you know, less technically inclined people on your team be able to contribute. Yeah, I think that there's definitely hope. Uh, we actually recently got some some designers who had never used version control to wrap their head around GitHub, and the GitHub for Mac client made it very easy for them. So uh, I think that there's definitely hope, and it's going to keep growing, and adoption will probably keep growing. So, yeah, but, you know, if you haven't used Pros or if you're looking for a kind of a online editor for you know, a blog and a or a static site, or uh, just even while it's not specifically suited for doing any kind of you know code markup editing, it's definitely worth checking out. Mousetrap JS, another plugin. Yeah, so Mousetrap is basically uh, again most of these, especially with the JavaScript articles, these are ones that I've used personally that have made my life a lot easier. So I just kind of wanted to share that, but. Um, you know, Mousetrap basically makes it easy to do keyboard shortcuts. Um, Craig Campbell, who was the author behind, was it Rainbow, I think? Yeah, Craig Campbell, one of the authors behind Rainbow, or the author behind Rainbow, actually, you know, wrote this very small little library. And basically, it just makes handling JavaScript shortcuts easy. Um, you know, and it handles sequences, and it handles key combinations. It's similar to what, if you're used to the Gmail sequences, and uh, it's very, very easy to do, very easy to use. And I love use. the Gmail sequences. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's they're kind of pioneers in that little world. So to 
you know, see other, it's, it's becoming easy to use that stuff in any website. Very exciting. What I liked about this one is the syntax. Um, there's no futzing around with character codes and uh, modifier keys and all of that stuff. You pretty much express them in a string just like you would want to capture them. So G space I captures G and then I, like in Gmail and Command Shift K, if you want to actually, you don't have to worry about what the codes are for any of those keys, which makes it very developer friendly. You know, speaking of Gmail shortcuts, I don't use the web interface since they uh, totally um, whitewashed it <laughs> beyond all use <laughs> for me. Um, I switched over to Sparrow about that same time, which uh, I'm saddened to, to find this week is uh, getting sucked into uh, the Google Borg, no longer to be updated. Yeah, it sounded like they're only going to be releasing maintenance releases for Sparrow, but... Um... Have you ever used the uh, Gmail client on your iPhone? I have. And it, it have. definitely leaves uh, leaves a lot to be desired. And I think Sparrow can maybe bring some of that expertise in there to help out with some of the interfaces for that stuff. So uh, you never know. I mean, I read, a, I read an article that basically said we might, for the first time ever, see an actual native Gmail client for your Mac too. So we'll see. I would, I would love you know some of this talent acquisition that they do be a little bit, uh, I guess, more defined and that the, pro the products <laughs> that they're acquiring surface, you know, under the Google brand and not just get sucked up and uh, disappear forever. There's been a lot of uh, tools that I've used over the years. I know PageRank was one of those that I loved um, for measuring social analytics and our buddy Ilya uh, got acquired by Google and uh, they've got some of those features now built into Google Analytics, but I'm not so sure that... Uh, when it happens that way, if the end result is always as strong as kind of the separate offering that they had going in. Yeah, it does kind of seem like they they pull in a product and then take the team from that product and apply it to the core team rather than, you know, con continuing a product or developing a new product. So sometimes it's almost hard to f figure out where they went or even if they're still with the company. The uh, web interface for Gmail is just... Uh, Cannot explain it. It was one of those things where, you know, it wasn't the prettiest thing in the world, but it was so darn usable that everybody loved it. And, uh, you know, now it's just, I, there's such an incredible lack of contrast in the thing that I just can't even use it. <laughs> I think the Gmail one specifically is bad because when they've redesigned everything, I, I liked most of the stuff. I, I like a lot of the redesigns, even for, you know, this the newer version of Google Plus and the newer Google Docs and that stuff. I, I actually enjoy that, but yeah, it does seem like in specifically in Gmail, it kind of missed. Notice RDO came out with a similar redesign where they whitewashed pretty much the whole thing. Uh, they had a very iTunes um, type of design, and now I guess it's been over a month ago, they came out with just this very, very stark white interface and the first time I fired it up after the update that morning it was just my office which I normally like natural light and I've got the overhead light off until um, I just prefer the the natural light instead of the uh, the overhead light and my whole office lit up with just this big bright screen from from the RDO interface I'm not sure if you're an RDO user but uh, in the last couple of days they've been inching a little bit more contrast and color back into that thing yeah, I actually am an RDO user, and the when they updated it to the new interface, um, well, first I felt like, you know, when you in those old movies, not old movies, but where you're watching the computer hackers, and they're sitting in front of their computer screen in the dark room, and their whole face is lit up blue, because, you know, that's that's like how computer hacking apparently works. Um, <laughs> it it kind of had that feeling for me, too. I just, my whole face lit up white and why is it that movies do that if you're on a computer and you're hacking csi does this all the time and i catch a lot of the csi reruns um you know they work in this crime lab and i don't know if they always work the night shift but there's never any lights on in this whole place and everything's like black lights and blue un underneath the uh, counter lights hollywood yeah well no that's what we do right i mean we lock ourselves in basements with uh, eight liter bottles of mountain dew and don't come out for five days I'd love to pay somebody from Hollywood to outfit my office with uh, what they think a hacker's <laughs> office would look like. Yeah, actually, with RDO, as, you know, the other thing was when I when I loaded it up after the uh, after the install, I thought like there was must have been a background image that didn't come up or something. Like it just broken style sheet. Yeah, it seemed like something was broken, and it does seem like they're inching some of that contrast back in. I would encourage them to keep going that direction because 
you know, when actually when Spotify and RDO were kind of competing for my business, um, the interface was the big thing that that uh, kept me on RDO. And you know, I'm not gonna tell anyone what they should or shouldn't do with their company, but I definitely liked it before a little bit more. To do MVC, so <laughs> for some reason, every uh, JavaScript framework out there, the canonical example is to create a to-do list manager. And so Addy has created to-do MVC. This is one of the ones you posted. Yeah, so, you know, I, I, I think I just seem to notice maybe even a year ago that the de facto standard uh, example application was always a to do and i don't know where that started for these you know single page javascript frameworks but it just seemed like that's kind of where it took off and so it seems like addy at very you know obviously if you haven't heard of him he's very well known javascript guru um but it seemed like you know if they're going to kind of start to approach it from that direction let's just pull them all into one place and make it very easy to to see them all and to use them all and to see how they work and a neat little project i mean not you know, this isn't the open source project in the same sense that we usually like to cover it, but it is open source code and um, just kind of a lot of examples. And I think the last I checked, there was like 20, you know, low 20s of projects that are currently in progress. And one of the questions I get asked all the time is, you know, how can I get started in, in open source? And I actually, I asked that question myself to, uh, you know, some of the guys from ThoughtBot just a few years ago, you know, how do you get how do you get started? You know, I, I mean, I feel like I have a little bit of skill in coding and I just, but I'm not well known. So how do I get started? And this is a great example of, of a, of a launching pad. If you need one, they have, you know, 23 projects that are in progress and, um, they're more than willing to, to bring you on to help out with those projects. They're also very excited. If there's another uh, framework that you're aware of, that's not currently, in the project, you know, it's just a neat little place to get your feet wet and start to help out with some of these. But yeah, it's it's an interesting little project, and you'll you'll see just a lot of different flavors of JavaScript frameworks if you jump into it. You know, one of the great things you can do is jump into a project and and contribute. Go to the issues list, see what bugs have been filed, see if you can you know, submit a patch with tests, preferably. Um, and the more you tune your ear to problems and kind of turn that around into opportunity. It's really easy to uh, to jump in and, and contrib contribute to a project just because there's way more, um, I guess, complaints <laughs> a lot of time than there is praise. So, uh, you know, as a um, maintainer of several projects, you know, I'm always ecstatic when I get a, a patch and it includes uh, a fix for something that's broken and has tests to boot. And you specifically love it when it's your Ruby gems and it has like a version bump in it, right? I please don't touch my touch my version <laughs> file. <laughs> don't touch the gem spec. Don't touch the version file. But you know that's you bring up a good point. Look at the README and look at the contribution guidelines. And some projects don't you know take patches. Um, there's just certain protocols around each little community. But uh, for the most part, if it's a bun GitHub, people are begging for your codes. Yeah, and speaking of contribution guidelines, if the project you're looking at does not have them specifically, just look at the code and follow the same stuff that everyone else is doing. But yeah, this is a uh, to do MVC great place to kind of get involved if you're trying to figure out. And, and I would encourage you to, you know, no matter how good you feel you are as a developer, the one of the great things about the open source world is the people working in open source are tend to be very open about helping and open about you know get helping to get you started. So you know, just jump in and start doing stuff and you'll start to kind of figure out where you like to work, where you like to help out and then where you're needed. And that's one of the questions that, you know, I've tried to start asking the the articles that I write up, the articles that I'm writing up, I've tried to start asking the authors of those projects, you know, where is a good place for somebody to get involved? And uh, it's it's interesting to hear the responses because generally speaking, you know, again, with, with the open source world, people like they just kind of say, you know, we're looking for people to test it for bug fixes, for new features, but what we really want is just to get in GitHub, look at the issues, and see what people are talking about. And that's the perfect place to kind of jump in and start helping out. Absolutely. Let's end on one that's a bit lighter. Uh, don't get blame me, I was pairing t-shirt. So I sent out a tweet, uh, a free t-shirt idea with that 
as the slogan. Um, Teespring picked that up and turned it into a product. And over 80 of us bought it and appreciate uh, those of you that helped out with that. Mine came in the mail a couple of weeks ago. It fits great, American Apparel. And uh, I'll probably be sporting that at a conference near you pretty soon. Yeah, I actually bought, uh, I think, two of my uh, my two of my favorite T-shirts in the last, you know, six months have been the Don't Get Blamey t-shirt and the Cheddar t-shirt. I have both of them and I wear them uh, quite often, so I guess that is the uh, nerdy computer hacker part of me that we were talking about. But yes, yeah, it's, it's neat to uh, it's neat to, to get especially when they're high quality t-shirts from American Apparel. Um, Absolutely. Not some of the other uh, you know, some of their competition is a lot heavier, thicker. Yeah, I like, I like them. Cheddar is uh, Cheddar app Sam's to-do list in the sky, but powered by push. So um, all of your devices are instantaneously updated whenever you update the website and vice versa, which is pretty cool. Yeah. And ironically, I'm not sure if you saw my tweet last week where I spilled cheese in my cheddar shirt. <laughs> I did not see that. Oh, the irony was painful. Do you know where the name cheddar even came from? I, I mean, I just assume it was kind of, I think he's a burger enthusiast. So I just assume it came from, I don't know. I don't know. We'll have to ask Sam on a future show. Yeah. Well, thanks, Andrew, for joining us and popping the cork on this first uh, edition of the uh, wrap-up this year. Yeah, no problem. I really enjoyed it. It's a lot of fun. 